Hello, friends, and welcome back to the Bikes for Death podcast. As always, my name is Patrick, and I'm your host. And on today's episode, I'm excited to bring you a chat with my friend, Louis Sador, who is fresh off his third place finish at Tor Te Waipunamu, which is a relatively new race. This was its third year, and it takes place on the southern island of New Zealand. Many of you may be familiar with Lewis. He was the 2018 Tour Divide winner, and he was also the host of another bikepacking podcast called Overland Archive. But if you're new to the scene, you may not be as familiar with Lewis as he's been keeping a lower profile over the last four years. The last race he won was in 2020 at the Vic Divide, which is actually the race that he created. And since then, I've noticed that he hasn't been releasing episodes on his podcast and he hasn't been entering races and has been keeping a lower profile on social media and such. And as a fan, I was really excited to see him back in the lineup racing again. I was excited to see him get a great result. And I was really excited to chat with him on today's episode and catch up with him to see what's been going on. And uh, one of the really cool storylines about his race at TTW was that at one point, with only 300 miles left in the race, he was in 12th position, and he managed to ride his way through the field to secure a podium position, which is truly amazing after a four-year hiatus on the race scene. So it was really cool to catch up with Lewis I had a great time chatting with them, and it was really cool to hear about this race. This is the first time we've talked to anyone who's done the TTW, and this route looks absolutely brutal, and it looks absolutely beautiful, and we're going to talk all about it on today's episode. But before we get into it, let's take a moment to thank the people that made it possible, starting with our latest patron. This week, we'd like to thank Noelle Battle for signing up to be a sustaining member of the Bikes for Death podcast. She is actually the executive director for Bikepacking Roots, and so it was a real treat to see her come through and support the podcast. And uh, we're actually going to be collaborating with Bikepacking Roots uh, on some stuff in 2024 and probably beyond. So uh, we'll be hearing more from Noelle on future episodes If you enjoy this podcast and you would like to help support it, a great way to do that is over at patreon.com forward slash bikes or death. I don't have to probably tell you that it's tough times in the cycling industry. The cycling industry as a whole is still reeling from this post COVID world. And you're probably aware that many companies are laying off, that they're discounting their bikes. And overall, it's kind of a tough time to be in the bike business. And as a small company that relies solely on support from listeners and from brands that support what we do, it has been challenging this year to find the support that we need to keep the podcast sustainable. In fact, uh, I have decided that it is time to reactivate my real estate license. I gave it a go last year and fully committed to Bikes or Death in 2023. And unfortunately, I just haven't been able to make ends meet and I'm gonna have to pick up some side work to kind of fill in the gaps. And I guess while I'm talking about it, this may be a little bit unorthodox, but if you by chance happen to be looking to buy or sell a house in the Bryan College Station, the greater Bryan College Station area, send me a message. I'd love to chat, but I really want the listener to know that I am absolutely committed to bikes or death. I'm not going anywhere. I have no idea how I'm gonna juggle Uh, my real estate career and bikes for death, but um, I will figure it out. I will continue to produce episodes and I will continue to put my heart and my soul and my passion for bikes for death and for this community into everything that I do. So if you'd like to help out now is really a great time. We could really use your support I've said it before, but the lion's share of support that Bikes or Death receives is directly from the listener, which is absolutely amazing. 
this podcast is for the community. And so to see the community stand up and support what I'm doing really means so much. And I can't thank you enough. It is an absolute pleasure to be here. I never take it for granted and I never take for granted all the support that we receive. All right, well, next up, I wanna tell you about my bike, the Panorama Kata Den. You heard me talk, I'm sure, about Panorama historically. I really love this company. I love what they stand for and I love the bikes that they build. And I have been riding the Kata Den for over a year now. I, it has been my go-to bike and I absolutely love it. I genuinely do. It is so much fun to ride and it is so comfortable and it is versatile, which are the three main things that I look for in any bike. So the Kata Den is their carbon gravel bike and I wanna just highlight some of the features that really stand out to me. If you go to their website, they say that it has progressive gravel geometry. And what that means to me is that, as I mentioned, this bike is insanely comfortable to ride, but it doesn't feel like it's sacrificing on the speed aspect as well. For me, Comfort is king. If you're comfortable on your bike, you are a happy cyclist. And if you're happy, you'll be on your bike longer. And I think in the end, as endurance cyclists, that pays dividends overall. It also includes internal frame routing for a dynamo hub and for a dropper seat post, which I just get a kick out of. I personally don't have a dropper on my gravel bike. Uh, but I love that they included that as an option. And I think that that speaks to their intent when creating this bike is this bike was designed to get gnarly. And if you're getting gnarly on your gravel bike and you want a dropper post, they have internal routing for that. Let's talk tire clearance. It'll fit up to a 48 millimeter tire on a 700 C wheel or a 2.1 inch tire on a 650 B. So again, versatility, big tires, skinny tires, you can really customize it to fit the terrain that you're riding. Also wanna highlight all of the mounting points. Again, these bikes are built with adventure in mind and they did not miss an opportunity to put every single mounting point option on this bike. I have loaded this thing up on numerous bikepacking trips, short ones, long ones, and I've never had a hard time finding a place to put gear, which is obviously super important. And new for 2024, they are offering new drive train options. So they offer GRX in either a one by 12 or a two by 12 now. And another kind of cool thing that I like about Panorama is all of their bikes include art from a local artist that represents something. And so on the 2024 Kata Den, there's artwork of the conifer pine, which is really prevalent in Canada. And it speaks to Panorama's commitment to do its part for the environment, which is something I've talked about a lot. It's another thing that I really love about this company that they are leading the way in sustainability. And that little touch of artwork is a nice nod to that and a reminder of what this company stands for. Some other great things about Panorama is that they have a five-year warranty on all of their bikes and they offer 10-day free return. So if you get the bike and you're not happy with it, they will take it back. Of course, check their website for the terms and conditions for that. But I can tell you that Panorama is absolutely committed to their customers. They're committed to building great bikes that are adventure ready and that are being sustainably built. So if you'd like to learn more about Panorama and specifically the Kata Den, check out the link in the show notes. And if you're considering buying one, please use that link because that's an affiliate link. And if you decide to buy one, Bikes or Death will get a little kickback. You can also find that affiliate link along with all the others at bikesordeath.com. At the very top, there's a link to affi our affiliate so you can find all of our affiliates there. And every time you click on one, Bikes or Death gets a little bit of money and a little bit of money can go a long way. 
All right, everybody, that's all we got for you. Now let's get to today's episode with my friend, Louis Sador. But first, let's have my other friend, Miles Arbor, kick it off with the Bikes or Death theme song. You load up your bike, you ride away from home. You could be with your friends or you could be alone. You ride for a day or maybe more. You just love being in the great outdoors. Everything you need is strapped to your boss, including that new pillow you got from Santa Claus. And then you think, oh shit to yourself. You left that super lightweight tent on the living room shelf. Bikes. Oh, death. Bikes. Oh, 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 death. Podcast. Things are happening. Yo. Yo. I got breakfast in my beard, but... I was about to say, what do you do? <laughs> what do you got there? <laughs> uh, just cereal. <laughs> just cereal? Yeah. Did, I give, give you enough, did you have enough time to... Uh, Wake up this morning, and I guess you got some food and some coffee. Yeah, this is coffee number two. I checked in, and you you weren't here yet, so I was like, I'm going for coffee number two before <laughs> I settled settle in. Hell yeah, man! How are you doing? Yeah, yeah, pretty good, pretty good. I can just move over this side of the, yeah. of the couch. Get yeah. comfy. You feel you feel good about that spot? Yep. Yeah, this is the one. <laughs> <laughs> where are you at right now um it's actually pretty fucking rad um so brian the the organizer uh route creator of uh tour te Waipunamu, um has a house like an airbnb or something rented out um near the finish it's like a, f- a few a few miles i guess like a, a couple miles from the finish and um He's been, he, he drives down and he collects the finishers and snaps a photo at the finish and then brings them back here. And then we get fed and somewhere to sleep and somewhere to shower and sort of become human again. Um, oh, hell yeah. And then like sort of as each rider becomes more human, then they're able to start taking care of the next people. And it's really, it's really amazing. And it's cool to sort of have uh, the community element um to it at the end and we've all got to kind of yeah take care of each other and debrief with each other and you know commiserate and yeah uh share share stories and and of i guess ways we you know we experience the route either similarly or differently um depending on you know time of day and condition that we're going through different sections but um yeah it's been really amazing to spend a few days here at the end afterwards and just get to yeah, wind down from it, start to feel a bit more human and, and yeah, get to share the experience with, with everyone else and, and sort of feel that community. It's, it's actually really special. Yeah. Yeah, that really is. That's something that I've really noticed like with my own, the East Texas showdown or the Texas showdown series that I do here in Texas, like we always bring everybody together at the end. And I think that's one of the, the coolest parts about the whole experience is just being able to like share it with other people. Cause I've said before, like, you know, you go back to your work life or your home life and most people cannot relate to what (laughs) you just did. So, you know, having some time to, like you said, commiserate and share notes and, and just share the stoke with like other people that went through the same experience you did in their own way is, is really neat. Uh, how many, how many of y'all are, hold up in that house there um people are coming and going like some people are leaving you know coming finishing sleep in a few hours and then and then taking off um or their partner comes and gets them or whatever but um we've, we're probably we're probably 12 at the moment um it was oh, wow. probably up to it's probably up to nearly 20 at one point it must be a big house yeah well there's like um it's kind of like a there's like the one house and it's part of like a, a farm property and then they have like a, a bunch of accommodation within it. So there's like the one big house and then um, a few smaller little like apartments. And then there's another house that's like a mile down, down the road as well. So, yeah. So you're headed out, uh, you're heading back to Australia a little bit later today. That's home for you, yeah. right? Australia. 
How are you feeling, man? Uh, well, actually, how many days ago did you finish? And uh, yeah, and how are, how are you feeling mentally, physically, now that you've had a little bit of rest? Yeah, um, oh, geez, um, three, <laughs> three days ago, I think. Nice. Um, and yeah, no, starting to feel, feel pretty good. I've got like the usual sort of like tingly, tingly fingers. Um, sort of my, my, my ring finger and thumb are, yeah, a bit tingly and, and weak on both hands. And, um, which is just, I mean, pretty standard. I think it's, it's the median nerve compression. Um, and then the, 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 the cankles, uh, are, are going back to normal. Um, but yeah, I had a bit of, <laughs> bit of swollen ankles um but i think that's that's pretty standard as well um um other than that like yeah that's that's all sort of i mean the tingling that'll take a few weeks at least usually cankles are going down and otherwise surprisingly good um yeah no a little bit of maybe achilles like stiffness um but didn't have any issues with that during the race or anything i think it's just yeah gone a bit stiff now that i've stopped um yeah the rate the impacts of what you're doing uh finally caught up to you some of it yeah (laughs) yeah uh and then mentally um yeah pretty good like definitely was a bit foggy for a few days there like lots of sleep in um definitely falling asleep on the couch here at the house a few times while there's like a million things going on around me and just like, yeah, just in the, in the middle of the day, just absolutely dead to the world. Like, (laughs) yeah. When people just like yelling and and screaming and whatever all around telling their stories and stuff. So pretty funny, but yeah. Yeah. Getting there. Eating all the food and, and drinking, drinking all the water and, um, yeah. Trying to catch up on sleep. I can imagine. I, uh, yeah, my, I've been at the end of the tour divide a few times now, and it's always interesting to kind of see the aftermath of, uh, you know, the experience that your body just went through, like all the food. I mean, you just pour tables upon tables of food and it, it's just a, a kind of a juggling act for them between um, eating a bunch of food and then sleeping and then sharing some stories. And it just, that process just, kind of repeats itself for uh it seems like a few days after a big event like this just trying to uh catch up on on what the body needs for sure yeah yeah 100 percent. yeah it's pretty funny the amount of food we're going through here with like a, a large amount of people but um yeah everyone going through the exact same thing and it's like someone will go for a run to town to get food and they're like, all right, I think I've got, an, we've got enough to last us a while. And it just gets <laughs> inhaled. It's like the more you put down, the more people eat. Like it just, yeah. It's <laughs> yeah bottomless pits for sure. Well, man, I'm excited to chat with you. I appreciate you, uh, you coming on to share your experience. Um, for people who don't know, you were on the podcast back on episode 51 August 20th, you and I actually did a collaboration podcast whenever you were doing your Overland Archive uh, podcast. And so, you know, I wanted to catch people up to speed, catch myself up to speed on uh, on what you've been up to kind of since then. I'm curious, uh, as, as a starting point, um, you used to own a bike messenger company, and it seems like uh, I, I heard through social media that you're not doing that anymore. Is that is that true? And, and what are you doing these days? Yeah, um, a couple of years ago, I, I sold that business up. Um, me and my business partner were both sort of ready to move on. He was he was doing a degree in paramedicine, and I was kind of just I'd been a career for uh, twelve years at that point. And, um, like absolutely like incredible job, like super fun, but like sort of felt like I didn't have any other, yeah, skills or qualifications on paper and wanted to sort of start moving on, um, and, and sort of developing skills and stuff that could, you know, progress into more of a career, um, with, yeah, something that I could see a bit more longevity in. I didn't mm. feel like I could be a, a career or want wanted to be a, a messenger forever. So, um, 
yeah, we sold up the business and um, I ended up moving from Melbourne to Canberra at the, the same time. Um, and um, I'm a trail builder up there. So we build and maintain um, mountain bike trails, but also hiking trails as well. Oh man, that is so fucking rad. That's an exciting yeah. job, isn't it? How lucky yeah. you get to go from bike messenger to trail building still in, you know, you still get to be a part of like, you know, there's the adventure sports, these outdoor sports, staying active, not sitting behind a desk, all that kind of jazz. That sounds fucking awesome. Yeah, it's it's amazing and definitely really rewarding. We, you know, we do everything from, yeah, maintaining the local mountain bike trails, um, hiking trails. And so like, you know, just the interactions with people. So like quite often we're working on open trail um, while like it's it's still active while we're working on it, depending on the, the situation so you might still have hikers coming through or if it's on on the mountain bike trails maybe um you know there's still adjacent trails so you still get to interact with riders while we're working and it's you know overwhelmingly a, a positive such a positive response when when you do get to see people that are stoked that you're out there working on the trails and we've built some pump tracks at um you know at some some uh i guess what what you guys call elementary school um mm. kind of age um, and, you know, seeing, seeing the kids response and how excited they are and how amped they get, they're getting to, to ride their bikes and stuff. It's, it's, yeah, super rewarding. Um, it is very physical, uh, which yeah. I found it, it, it's, while it's good, I guess, conditioning, um, it is, it is, does make it hard to, to juggle, um, training on top of that. But, um, yeah, as a, as a job, it's amazing. And I, I feel super fortunate to, yeah, as you say, fall from one really like amazing job into another. Yeah. Well, you took the question right out of my mouth because one thing I've noticed, and I, I think a lot of people have drawn these parallels, there's, there's a, or there's like a disproportionate amount of bike pack racers that also seem to be couriers or used to be bike messengers, um, you can see the correlation there between just, uh, how comfortable, how, how many hours you're putting on the bike, riding in all the different weather. Um, and, and now you're building trails and I'm wondering, yeah, how much that trail building, cause it's a very physically demanding job is, uh, is, is helping your, your overall fitness. But yeah, that sounds interesting. It's like, it's, you are maintaining a fitness, but at the same time, you might be like depleting yourself a little bit and not getting as much out of like your training. So yeah, you want to peel that back a little bit and, and tell us what that's like. Yeah. Like I, I think on a general level, it does provide, yeah, like a really good, um, base conditioning, fitness, that sort of thing. Um, but overall I do suspect that it's actually a hindrance. Um, it probably does create a level of fatigue that um yeah on the balance is affects the quality of like the workouts and stuff that i can do um Mm. i'm more and more factoring in uh gym work these days uh as well um as 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 riding and I, i definitely find like you know i'm i'm tired from work it's 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 hard and um that makes it hard to yeah, to get high quality workouts day in, day out. So, um, on the whole, like it, it helps and I'm definitely in really good shape, but I think potentially if I had a desk job and then could just have really specific high quality workouts, uh, in the gym and on the bike that that overall I would, um, potentially be in a better place, but it makes me happy. So that's kind of, you know, worth, worth the trade off and work worth, um, yeah, striking that balance with it. Yeah, I saw on one of your social media posts that said, you know, something along the lines of not a bad office view today. And it would look to be on top of some type of mountain. And uh, so it made me really curious, like what, yeah, what are you doing? Uh, so maybe tell us like, what is one of the, your favorite trails you've worked on or one of the coolest features you've, you've been able to like a project you've been involved with, like what's been one of your favorite highlights from trail building? Uh, last summer we, we got to do some work up in, um, Kosciuszko national park. So Mount Kosciuszko is the, like the highest peak in Australia, which is 
pretty unimpressive really like it's sort of 2000 meters so i don't know what that is like six six thousand feet something roughly. like that yeah yeah um and yeah like you can you can i don't know you could ride a scooter to the top of it like it's like literally it's 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 not it's nothing impressive and the trail is like super buffed out and there's just like a constant stream of tourists going to the top of it but it's a really it is outside of mount kosciuszko like the, the peak if once you sort of get off and more into the back country it's like an incredible area and we got to do some some work up there um some some like stone there's a lot of granite in the area so we were doing some um some steps and paving um rock paving with with um native granite and um i really enjoy rock work we actually do like a fair bit of that um especially with the hiking trails and there's yeah i don't know something it's a bit of just like a puzzle and a lot of problem solving to sort of get everything to fit together like when you do rock work and, like are you just finding rocks around the area and and putting them together like a puzzle or are you like chiseling them out like what what is rock work for i, I mean i don't I've never been a trail builder. I've done some trail work, but not as a profession for sure. Um, it varies. So there's some some work we do around Canberra in uh, Namadji National Park, which, um, yeah, we're doing exactly that. We're pulling rocks out of the bush, like whatever we can find on site. And yeah, building steps with that. In this case, um, they ha- there's a big rock uh quarry um which or it's actually not i guess not a quarry but like a big rock store from there's a there's a huge dam in the area um and a lot of rock had come out from building the dam and so they have this big aid it um rock storage area so we, they're actually chop choppering in the uh the stone for that oh. uh and then with gra- with granite it's too it's too dense to manipulate to chisel or anything so um, it's just whatever the shape is. You just got to find the right rocks in the right order to. Man, that's when you bring in the together. dynamite. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know who, who needs to appri- prove that. Just kidding. Yeah. Cool, man. Well, uh, I want to ask you about Overland Archive, uh, yeah. the podcast that, that you ran for a while. It seems like it's been, or it has been dormant for a while. Uh, I think a lot of people, you know, listen to it, myself included, like what, uh, what happened to that? Is that something you just decided to let go? Is it something you just put on the back burner for the, for a while? What's been going on with it? Yeah. Well, so when, when I moved to Canberra, um, uh, there's a, there's a, a housing crisis going on in the majority of Australia at the moment. Um, and it was, it was particularly severe at that time. So it was a really bad time to move. And I ended up being, um, not, I won't say homeless, but, uh, I didn't have a home for, um, three or four months. I was kind of just bouncing around on couches and whatever, (laughs) however I could find to sort of get by for a bit until I was able to finally secure a rental. And so all, all the majority of my possessions were in storage, including all my recording gear. And I just really lost steam with it. And then, um, my partner, Melissa had been stuck in Canada for over a year over COVID. Um, and so we were in the process of getting her visa and stuff sorted so that she could come join me in Canberra. And so just a combination of the two, by the time, like I, I found an apartment, she was almost there. And then, you know, just the focus was on, you know, being with, with each other. Um, and yeah, sort of settling into our our new life in Canberra. So yeah, it kind of just got on the back burner and I lost momentum with it and then haven't really, um, yeah, I mean, this is my first, first race since 2020 um so it's been four four years since i've raced and i think um yeah i guess the combination of those two like just being busy with with other things in in life and losing momentum with it and then also just i guess not being so active um within the scene 
just yeah it just meant i've been i guess a bit less engaged but it's definitely something that's on my mind and it's something that like people have asked me a lot about over the, the past week here um both out on the trail and then here at the house afterwards and it's it's definitely something that's been on my mind um the more i've been riding and preparing for this event and i've got some more stuff in the works um it's yeah i think the spark has been lit again so i'm um, yeah definitely considering sort of trying to get that ball ball up and rolling again but that said man like i feel um i know like when i was in the swing of it you know i felt you know you and i were constantly coordinating on on guests and who was asking who like to not <laughs> not wanting to overlap and stuff and you've been doing a great such a great job and i think like i started up because i felt like there wasn't i, I just felt like there was like kind of like a void there wasn't any i really love podcasts and i felt you know oh there's no one doing interviews like no one doing podcasts in the bikepacking space i should i should do something like I, that feels like something that, that really speaks to me um and then you know we both popped up around the same time and you know you've still be, been there like doing the interviews and asking asking the questions and getting the stories out of people so it's like it's kind of also felt like less necessary i guess mm. um because our, our, as a community like our stories are still being told through you so um yeah i guess while i do feel like i can yeah maybe offer a different conversation and there's there's still room for i think both of us to exist it's felt less what's the word not like less there's important just less but of less, a need yeah yeah but yeah i know it's it's definitely on my mind and i i do actually i i, I the silly thing is i even have like one interview that i recorded um <laughs> with uh with payson uh mckelvin after he was mm -hmm. here in tassie uh, or not here, but after he was in Tassie, I caught up with him in in Sydney, and I just another thing I just like lost steam on, and it's just sitting there in the in the archive. Like, but uh, yeah, I've been thinking about firing it back up, so we'll see yeah. once I get home. Maybe um, maybe it'll be there. <laughs> well, it's people don't I think fully realize how difficult it is to produce these episodes and you know there's a lot that goes on behind the scenes and it it's hard you know it's it's uh maybe not as hard as going and doing the tour divide or some of these big bikepacking races but it takes a lot of like a lot of time a lot of mental energy a lot of dedication um behind the scenes to produce them and um you know i you know it's a it's been a war of attrition to make it five years you know what i'm saying like there's definitely been many times where i've just been like you know like to use your word like lose steam it's like you gotta keep finding that passion um to keep firing up the mic and editing them and doing all the work that goes in behind it and i've had I mean, I, I was struggling like last week, like I was talking to my girlfriend last week and I was like, man, I'm having a hard time finding like that passion. You know, I'm having a really hard time finding the why. And there's a lot of, I mean, there's so many good things that come out of the, out of the podcast, but, um, it, you know, to, to this day, it can be hard for me to find that, that passion to like, just keep keep on doing it. So, um, I'll say, uh, I, I definitely agree with you. I think there's space for you and anybody else who wants to come and, and share these stories. Uh, if you ever, if you ever find that passion again, you're always, uh, not that you need my permission, but you're always welcome to, uh, join the podcasting ranks and, and share your voice. I, uh, I, our episode that we recorded together is still one of my favorite ones. I really enjoyed, you know, talking to you and I always enjoyed, uh, listening to your podcast. So yeah, but I totally get it. It's a, it's another job and it's another thing to do on top of a real job and relationships and, uh, doing the, the writing that you want to do. And, and I think that's one thing that I struggle with sometimes is like turning your passion and something you really love into a job. And then it just feels like, you know, every time I go on a bike ride, I need to be like producing some kind of content or, you know, every interaction I have, there's always like an angle of, of, you know, producing something, whether it's social media or something for the website or, um, something for one of my events or the podcast. I mean, and, and I, there's a, there's a part of me that kind of misses the simpler days of just 
going on bike rides and, and doing it for no other reason other than I just, I just want to be out there, you know, and I still want to be out there, but you know, I, it, this is like, I grapple with that sometimes, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I, I can totally relate. Like I've even like, feel like I've, I've definitely pulled back on social media and stuff as well. And like, you know, uh, I've, I've been writing a lot in, um, in the lead up for, preparation for to a ty punamu but you probably wouldn't know it like i haven't been you know like i used to yeah like every time i'd go for a ride be posting like shots and and content whatever and that's like on instagram and now i just i just can't be bothered with that like i kind of (laughs) just i just i just want to ride and enjoy it yeah Um, yeah but yeah i totally get it man it's uh it's pros and cons like anything in life, right? Because there's, you do get a lot of value out of like inspiring and connecting with other people. But, um, you know, it can also feel like somewhat of a job and an obligation. And, and, uh, it's something I struggle with too. So you, you kind of answered, I, I was, I'm curious, I was curious to kind of catch up to speed on, on your own personal, like racing career, so to speak, because, you know, for people who don't know, you won Tour Divide in 2018. In 2019, you signed up for Colorado Trail Race. Unfortunately, you had to DNF due to um, elevation sickness, right? And yeah. I, and then I was like, I don't know if my algorithms just aren't sending me the Louis Sador content on social media anymore, but it felt like, it kind of felt like I hadn't seen you on the scene in a while. So, um, maybe you can tell us, uh, and maybe you already have, like maybe just life shifts. Uh, but, um, yeah, what, it, what has been kind of the going on in your life? Like what's, what's been going on with Louis Sador over the last four years? Why have you stepped away from racing as it seems? And, um, yeah, what's been going on with that? Um, okay. So, so true divide was, uh, 2018, um, and then, yeah, Colorado Trail attempt 2019. Um, then 2019, I'd started uh, the Vic Divide here in, in uh, or I keep saying here, not in his, <laughs> but yeah, I, I started the Vic Divide and, and then, which is a 550K race in Victoria, um, starting in Melbourne. And... I DNF'd you to a mechanical that first year and then won it in 2020. And that's the last time. So February 2020 was the last time I'd raced. Then obviously COVID happened after that. And we had a pretty like rough time of it with lockdown, like some severe lockdowns, um, especially in Melbourne, but across Australia. And then even once, you know, those lockdowns were ended, we still, there was still probably another year or so before international travel was uh, available to us again. So we were definitely like really isolated from the rest of the world um, and limited in, in those respects. Um, so yeah, like there just wasn't the opportunity to race for, you know, over two years really, um, which was super frustrating. Um, and then, yeah, as I sort of mentioned, just my move to Canberra took, uh, took some time and energy and, and settling in, there with melissa last year uh so yeah 2023 i was training for um an fkt attempt um there wasn't really any events that were speaking to me uh in australia and i was at that point wasn't really in a position uh financially to travel overseas um so was looking at something to do uh, within Australia. Um, and I was training up, yeah, for FKT attempt on the Mawson trail, which is in the sort of through the Flinders ranges, um, in South Australia and sort of finishes in Adelaide. That's nine, 900 Ks. Um, and I was getting already, I was like a, a couple of weeks out from that and they got hit by, uh, some massive storms and like most of the trail was flooded. Um, and so I pushed it back a couple of weeks and then they got smashed by another storm and had more flooding. Um, so at that point I kind of just had to pull the pin on it. Um, I was sort of missing, missed, missed the window of opportunity, which was super frustrating, especially after a few years off. Um, you know, I felt like, yeah, 
I was really, I sort of really needed it. Uh, I felt like I really was looking forward to it and needed that kind of, I think anyone that races these things understands there's uh, some, some level of, um, how do you say it? I don't know. Just like the, it just gives you something. There's a, like a release and a, a time for introspection and, um, yeah, just being with yourself that, that these racings give you just time alone and in that flow state and yeah, just, just sitting with yourself. It's, it's something really special in, the, in interacting with the, the environment around you in, in a really like intimate way. Um, and I felt like I really needed that at the time. Um, so that was really frustrating to sort of have that taken away. Um, mm. And yeah, that sort of got, got me to hear um, Brian Alder. Um, yeah, the, the, the rap creator had asked me or invited me to come to the first uh, Tour Te White Panamu in 2021. Um, then, yeah, COVID hit, obviously. The second running was 2022. It didn't happen in 23. Uh, then... Um, yeah, now it's it's going to be happening every every other year, um, not every year. Um, so right. yeah, this is sort of the been wanting to get over here since twenty twenty one when he first invited me, but um, here I am, twenty twenty four finally, and <laughs> yeah, it feels r- really good to be back. But it was definitely an intimidating, um, yeah, prospect. It was it was it was hard getting to the start line just purely because it'd been so long, and I wasn't sure if like. I still had it or if I was still that guy or if I still, I guess I still had doubts about my ability to push that hard. And if that was something that I still genuinely wanted. Right. Yeah. I want you to touch on, like, I think, um, I know like my audience, myself included, well, not my entire audience, but I survey, I poll like, at the end of the year, I always pull the listeners to get their feedback on the show and what types of things they would like to hear about. And the reality is, is like most people who are interested in bike packing and even bike pack racing are just people who like to go ride their bike, like to be in the woods, like to go on adventures. And that's, that's the thing that like really connects us. It's not necessarily being the fastest on the course or not sleeping for five days and, you know, all this jazz, it's, it's that love and the passion for the outdoors. And so I wonder if you could touch on like, what what has been fueling your adventurous fire over the last four years? Like what kinds of uh, trips are you going on? What kind of riding just inspires you? Like with no agenda, with no uh, fanfare of dot watchers or big events or anything like what, what, are, what do you turn to and what kind of satiates you and, and fills that um, passion and that fire and that love for just going and adventuring? Yeah, I mean, always just like exploring new places. And so it was really, really rad, like moving to Canberra and just all of a sudden having like this new, right. this new backyard to go explore, um, like a new, and, and it, Canberra is really close to the mountains. We have the Brindabellas and then the Magi National Park are really close um, to town. And then sort of beyond that, you get Kosciuszko National Park that I was talking about before. Um so yeah, really, really great area to explore and one that you can sort of tap into rolling out my front door. Um, so that was really great. I did actually, what year would that have been? 20, maybe 2022 start. No, maybe it was the start of 2023 over the Christmas break. I, I had a project, um, of summiting the 10 highest peaks in Australia. Um, and that was, sort of like linking them together by bike. And then I would leave my bike at sort of the bottom of um, the foot trail or, or get sort of getting as close as I could to the summit by bike. And then, um, yeah, leaving the bike, putting on some trail runners and hiking to the top. Um, and so all up, I can't, I'm trying to remember the numbers. I think it was something like, 200 miles maybe uh riding and then maybe like 60 70 miles on foot um and i did that in three days or something 
Wow. Um, and that was really cool. I really, that was something that I thought about for a long time. Um, and I guess not racing, it kind of like allowed me to sort of focus on this sort of quirky other thing. Um, but that was really enjoyable actually. Like I felt I wasn't in particularly great shape when I did it, but being able to like, I found like I would start to get tired on the bike, but then like I would switch to hiking, you know, I'd leave the bike and then switch to hiking for a few hours and then that'd be fine. And then like my feet would be getting sore. Uh, and then I jumped back on the bike and yeah. it was like this really cool, cool way. And that kind of came about, I was, I mean, I love bikepacking, obviously, like it's, it's a phenomenal, um, way to, to move through terrain and to see the landscape. But often when I'm doing it, I'm, I'm riding through the mountains, but you're always sort of like looking up at the peaks and you're like, whoa, that's cool. Like it would cool, be cool to go up there. It'd be cool to go up there. And inevitably, like with my style, I'm just always on a mission. I'm always in a rush. Um, so I, I it, it's rare for me to sort of stop and take those side trips. So to sort of create um, uh, an objective that was to take those side trips and mm. was to see those peaks, but still um, designed around, yeah, like human power transport and, and self-sufficiency. Um, that was really cool. And I really enjoyed that, that style of movement, um, sort of combining the two. And, you know, some of that was, yeah, some of that was, I mean, it was Mount Kosciuszko was obviously one of them. It's the the tallest peak in Australia. So like that one was like super easy to leave the bike and just like walk up a super groomed trail, like a kilometer, um, to the summit. And then some of them, there was no trail. And so you're, um, you know, navigating off trail through like thick scrub and stuff to to push up to the summit. And yeah, some of them were up to, there, there was a, um, one section, there was the biggest part. I think there was four peaks out on the main range, um, which is sort of adjacent to Kosciuszko. And so that was a big, like 30 mile loop ticking off four peaks or so in that um on foot and then the rest of them were sort of just like one by one off of yeah. my bike route but um yeah really cool way to, to move through the mountains and that's always yeah, that's just crazy. been my mo it's just like i just like being in the mountains and kind of makes you feel insignificant just taking on these big object objectives and big days like i still always enjoyed that um it just hasn't been in a racing setting yeah. What was your approach to that? Uh, the, I don't know. It wasn't an event, but that trip, that expedition, uh, did you, were you trying to go fast? Did you like, you know, were you taking sleeps? Were you getting your eight hours? Were you touring it? Uh, what was your approach to it? Yeah, I'd say it was like, uh, I kind of remember where I heard this term, but, uh, racecation. It was kind of like that. So it's a, <laughs> that's a good one. <laughs> so it, it was. It, I would say it was. It was like a race effort, except I was sleeping eight hours a night, pretty much. Nice. Um, yeah. So when I was when I was moving, like during the day, like I didn't stop, and just because I find that fun, like I, I if I, if I sit down for more than a couple of minutes to like eat a bit of food or something, like I just start to like. Um. I don't know, you know, people always say like, oh, don't you want to like stop and smell the roses or something? Um, but to me, like sitting in one spot and just like looking around isn't particularly engaging. And, you know, I don't, I don't want to yuck anyone else's yum. Like if that's, if that's what, you know, they enjoy is as sort of sitting there and taking in all the small details. Like I can understand that, but it's kind of just not the way that my brain works. So for me, just continual movement and getting to process new information and seeing terrain change or um, vegetation change or or whatever that may be, see, seeing the terrain change around you, like for me, that's what I enjoy. Um, so yeah, just that continual movement throughout the day um, was was really. It is, is always um, sort of just the way I approach things. I struggle to sort of slow down during the day. But yeah, it definitely wasn't pushing into the night too much. I think on the last day, I pushed a couple of hours into the night hiking out to my second to last peak. 
Um, but that's also an area that I'd been to several times. I'm um, in a ridgeland that I'd crossed on foot. Yeah. I don't know how many times at this point. Um, so I didn't feel like I was missing too much and I was kind of just keen to keen to get it done. Um, but yeah, yeah, I was sleeping eight, sleeping eight hours every night and yeah, just moving faster in the day. I've done some, not like that, but, uh, a one, a couple of trips that I did that kind of, I can relate to is I, um, here in big Bend, the national park on far West Texas, uh, one year we bike packed and then we st- stashed our bikes and we hiked up to this Mariscal Canyon. And then the next year, uh, we bike packed and we carried our pack rafts and we got to the Rio Grande and then we floated through Mariscal Canyon. And it was really neat to like have the different perspectives of, of this mm-hmm. Canyon from above and below. But also, like you said, to, um, to just use your, use your full body. Like you're, you're getting tired on the bike and then you get in the water and you're like, ah, you're floating for a while and then your shoulders and arms are tired and then you get back on the bike and you know, the same goes for hiking. And, uh, that I think just human power travel is what I just, what I really eat up. Bikepacking is my favorite as well. It's, it's what it's kind of the bread and butter, but, um, mixing up, the bike packing with, with some other modalities of, of adventuring, you're getting to see the land, different landscapes that you wouldn't be able to see by bike. I mean, that's one of the limiting things about a bike is they can't go everywhere. Um, unless you want to hike it up with you, which I, I prefer to leave it. <laughs> Nobody likes to hike a bike. I don't think what, what did you do, uh, with your bike when you stashed it? to go hike up or run up these mountains? Um, so at Rawson Pass, which is the bottom of, um, is the, the sort of, um, yeah, the pass below Kosciuszko, it's a pretty high tourist area, but you can actually bike legally to Rawson's Pass. So I was carrying a little bike lock specifically for, um, for that place um and i locked so i locked my bike there with a pretty minimal lock but you know it's it's still somewhat remote so it's like it was just so long as it was locked in some capacity like i was pretty secure with it and then i i just stashed my helmet and uh my shoes in the bushes um and then the rest of the time yeah i just i just hid my bike in the bushes somewhere it was remote enough locations that i was not not concerned about um, yeah. Did you, uh, anything. like put a drop a pin or a GPS on where your bike was, or did you just remember where you put it every time? I think in one, in one specific spot I did, because it was like kind of, it all looked the same. There wasn't anything particularly defining. Um, so I did. And then the rest of the, the spots, it was like easy enough to just remember where I'd hit it. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like it worked out pretty well. I was just envisioning, I mean, people get lose their cars in parking lots, you know, <laughs> they come out of the yeah. grocery store and they're like, where the fuck did I put that thing? And I'm picturing yeah. you like, I mean, putting in a pretty big effort, climbing a mountain, coming down, you're probably tired and you're like, oh shit, where did, where did I put my bike? <laughs> yeah. Sounds like you, uh, yeah. Sounds like you managed it. I love it, man. Well, I think we're caught up to the most part. I mean, it's hard yep. to cover four years in a few minutes, but uh, let's uh, let's turn our attention to the TTW. I'm not even going to try to pronounce it. So what what is it called? You say it. So, so. yeah. So it's Tour Te Waipunamu, um, and Te, Te Waipunamu is the Maori name for the South Island of New Zealand. Right on. And so, that, that, that's essentially that's essentially what the race is. It's uh it's it's the length the, it's the northernmost point of the south island to the southernmost point so uh as we mentioned i think it's the ttw is in its third year it's a relatively new race um just give people an idea of of what the route is and a general overview of of what the route is um as a starting point for this conversation yeah so I, as i mentioned it tra- traverses the the length of New Zealand's South Island, uh, which is 1300 kilometers 
uh, what is that? 500 miles or something, maybe? Oh, um, no, it's uh, 807. Oh, there you go. According to Google. Okay. Google, I, in, in Google, we trust. <laughs> it's 1,300 kilometers, right? Yeah, yeah, 1,330. Now you're making me second guess Google. Let me make sure I did it right. Kilometer to miles. You went further than you, well, yeah, 807 miles. Yeah. So it's a, yeah, that's a long race. Yeah. And honestly, longer than it sounds. It's, there's a lot, a lot of really slow kilometers in there or miles in there. So um, I feel like most people think of, uh, you know, an ultra race and an off-road one and they're like, oh, you can do, you know, uh, 150 to 200 miles a day. It's like, n- no, at, at some points you're doing 70 miles a day. Like it is slow. So, um, yeah. but, um, how to, how to describe the TTW. I, I actually, we've had this conversation a lot. I wouldn't call it a bikepacking race. Okay. Uh, we, we've sort of all come to the conclusion that it is a single discipline adventure race. Okay. Um, so I don't know. Actually, do, do you guys have it? Is adventure racing big in the U.S.? It's really big in New Zealand, and it's it's pretty big in Australia. Um, I wouldn't say it's big here. We have it. Adventure racing was actually my entry point into bike packing. Uh, the mm. Eco Challenge back in like the ni- late nineteen yeah, nineties, yeah. early two thousand, like that was kind of my introduction to adventure sports. And then I got into adventure racing on a small scale. And then I found out about bike pack racing, but I don't see a lot of adventure races these days. Maybe it's just cause I'm like kind of removed for it, but from it, but, um, yeah, yeah. I, I know what it is for sure. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, there's just a lot, so there's a lot of hike a bike, but then there's a lot of, uh, beyond hike a bike, like there's a lot of spots where you have to carry your bike. Um, and within that, there's a lot of places where you have to carry your bike and there is no trail. Um, Mm. and you're, you're having to navigate yourself, um, off a combination of, um, the GPX trail, which is Brian has made sure is incredibly accurate in those key locations. Um, course note, written course notes, uh, writ, like written description of the terrain that you're covering. And it's, it, it is incredibly important to have a really good understanding of the written course notes. And then uh, for me, um, being, uh, you know, a hiker as well, and, and, and sort of as I was sort of describing with that, um, that 10 Peaks uh, project, you know, I, I, I was doing some off-track navigation and, and that sort of stuff. Um, but having an understanding of navigating terrain without a trail um, is incredibly important. I think L- knowing how to read terrain, ridge lines, creeks, um, saddles, contours, that sort of thing, um, which I don't think necessarily is a skill for if if you're predominantly or exclusively a cyclist. Uh, a mountain biker, you ha- there's potentially no reason that you've ever had to sort of um, encounter those skills or develop those skills. Yeah, and um, it is a it is a by invite event um, or by sorry not by invite by application event, um, and I th- that is something as as far as I understand that having having the skills. Um, and the abilities to navigate um, and take care of yourself, um, be self-sufficient in in more ways than just your normal bikepacker um, is part of the prerequisites as far as I understand. Um, and but even amongst the field, like I could see could see some riders who, yeah, just don't have those um, skills and were definitely a lot slower moving those ter- through that terrain, sort of just, eyes glued to the gpx line and navigating off that and it will get you through but being able to look at the terrain and read it properly and just being able to like um yeah navigate based on the terrain was way more efficient um 
So definitely a good skill to have. What what are the rules there for following the route on sections where there's no trail? Um, you're just there's a GPX line. Like how yeah how strictly yeah because I think you're right. I think most people who go bike packing cycling we understand that there's a route. It's on a road. It's on a trail. You follow it, and and that's how you adhere to you know, staying on course, but how do they manage staying on course in these sections? Is it a little bit l- looser to find? Do you have like more wiggle room as, as a rider to navigate it the best way possible for yourself? Like how, what, what's the idea there? Yeah, definitely. There is like, I would, I would say there's like an accepted corridor that you're, um, traversing through but like ultimately like the um the plotted route is the best way through um and the most efficient way through so essentially you have to uh climb a ridge line up a spur um once you've gained the top of the ridge you go descend to one saddle across a, a you know a sub peak down to another saddle then you're contouring around across the face of a mountain to another spur and then descending that. Um, and I'm not sure if those are all terms that you, you guys, that everybody uses um, internationally to to describe those features. Um, I'm following you. But hopefully that makes sense. Um, there's kind of only like one one real way to do it. Like if if you tried to like... I don't know, skirt around the bottom of it or something, it would just take way longer. Like it's the way it's the, it's kind of the only way to do it. So, and the, the plotter route is the the fastest and most efficient way. So there's no, I guess it's kind of just accepted that if you kind of go off that route, you're at a disadvantage. Um, so there's no, there's no way you're shortcutting it essentially, or gaining an advantage by going off of it. So, so long as you're getting from the start of that section to the end of the section, you're kind of within the intent. Yeah, man. uh, Just researching to get ready for this episode, I was watching film and, you know, checking out social media and all the pictures. And that was one of the things that I really took away from, from looking at the route. I mean, number one, it looks insanely beautiful, but also the terrain that you guys are covering is it seems like everything like i saw beaches i saw hike bikes saw bushwhacking river crossings single track i mean it seems like it just it, it seems like it has a little bit of of everything is that an accurate perception of of what i'm seeing yeah abs- absolutely uh, yeah really really varied terrain it's incredibly beautiful like I, I kept, you know, being, you know, mildly strung out and sleep deprived for, for most of it. Um, I kept catching myself and like kind of not really knowing where I was in a way because like sometimes it looked like exactly like a Australian bush. And then sometimes it looked like you're in the Canadian Rockies and just like everything in between like you said so it's like sometimes it was just like really trippy you're like wait where am i (laughs) (laughs) yeah yeah you're like why am i on a beach i was just in the mountains this doesn't make sense uh what about like resupply how much uh i mean it just you know it's always hard to tell on social media and stuff like how much access to um, resupply points and stuff like that there is how remote is this course actually give us a sense of what that's like? Yeah. So the first day is pretty quick and you get quite a few, you get a couple of resupplies, um, in the first day. Um, you're going to have to help me again with distances here, but the first day I did 350 kilometers, um, which is, I don't know, 200, a bit over 200 miles, 217 miles. There you go. Um, and then Joe and Rufus, so I end up finishing third spoiler. Um, Joe and Rufus, <laughs> I think did 400 or 380. So like a little bit further along. Um, but yeah, the first day is quite quick. Um, that's 
you know, big a, a, amount of mileage for like a mountain bike ultra. Um, and then the yeah, day one is kind of a commute stage and then you're, you're in the shit. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So a couple of resupplies there and then, yeah, you get to this really isolated area where there is a road and, um, that you leave and sort of enter re- a really remote section. But in the, along that road, there's an outdoor education center called, called Boyle Lodge. Um, and we were able to, um, there's, there's also a, there's a hiking trail across the length of New Zealand called, uh, the Te Araroa, if I think I got that right. Um, but so they, Boyle Lodge does, um, Te Araroa hikers through hikers can send themselves supplies, um, to, to Boyle Lodge. Um, and they, from the first edition of this, um, offered to to do the same for um ttw racers so we were able to send before the race um, a box of of resupply there so that was really great to sort of have exactly the stuff that you want um and then beyond Boyle lodge it's sort of a minimum 36 hour push through to methan um which is the next resupply Assuming you hit Methven within their opening hours, which a lot of people didn't. So then you have another 200 kilometers beyond that, uh, which is 120 miles or something again, um, of very slow terrain, uh, through the Tekapo, which is your next resupply. So it's, uh, yeah, the, that, the middle part of the route is incredibly difficult for uh, resupply and you're doing some really challenging, yeah, covering some really challenging terrain, having, yeah, carry your bike on your shoulders, as I said, for hours at a time, in some cases, navigating off track terrain with, uh, a really heavy bike because you're carrying a lot of, a, a, a lot of food. So it's like, you know, it's one thing to sort of move like that under normal circumstances, but given that you're carrying you know, a couple of pounds of food as well. Um, just that added weight makes it even more difficult. And then once you're sort of through Tekapo, it's, um, yeah, resupply is not too difficult. You're moving faster again and the resupplies get closer together. Yeah. Yeah. Sounds fucking gnarly. It looks gnarly and it sounds gnarly. What, why, why this race after four years, what, you know, drew you out of the woodworks, what made you dust off your, uh, you know, your, your racing chops and take a stab? Like, what was it about this particular event that made you want to go race it? Um, as I said, um, uh, Brian invited me to the first one. Um, so, and then, uh, there was a movie made that's called South. Um, you can look that up. It's, it's on, YouTube, I think, or maybe Vimeo, one of the two. Yeah, watch it. It's really good. Yeah, it's 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 really good. And and Rob Dawson, who made that, um, was out recording for a second film. Um, for for yeah, he's making a film on on this year's event as well. So definitely keep an eye out for that. There's a trailer out already. Actually, he um, he whipped okay. something together, and it looks it looks good. And it actually, looks like his um like the first movie was really good, but in the intervening years, it looks like his cinematography and stuff has come a long way. And like the new trailer, like looks amazing. I'm really excited for it. Um, I think it's going to be really good. Um, what was the question? (laughs) Why this race? Oh yeah. Why this race? Um, yeah. So like I said, Brian had invited me. I mean, it's this side of the world. Like, I, I mean, New Zealand is so close to Australia and, I hadn't been since I was 11. We came on a, uh, uh, a little vacation. Like my mom, my sister was over here for some school choir thing or something. I can't remember. Um, and there was a, a, there was a fundraising raffle to get them over here. And uh, the prize for the raffle was flights to New Zealand. And I, I as an 11 year old, won the raffle um i got to come over so we got to have like a little trip over here um 
which, which was cool, but I hadn't been here since. And there was like, you know, I'd seen the amazing riding and I was like, you know what? Like I have to prioritize like getting over there to ride. Um, it's so close. It looks so amazing. I just, I've just got to make it a priority. So I did. In general um, is, Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Oh, um, I was just going to say, yeah, my friend Adam was also coming over, uh, to race. So, you know, we were preparing a lot together. He still lives in Melbourne. Um, but we did get together to ride, do some big missions together on the bike in preparation. Um, you know, spent a lot of time, you know, comparing notes on, on gear and that sort of stuff together. Uh, and then we met in Auckland and then traveled the rest of the way to the start together. So that was really amazing to get to sort of share that experience with him, even if we weren't racing together, but that was yeah, yeah, really important, really important to me to, to yeah get to share that with him and and spend some, some time with him. And yeah, just as a race, like the more technical, more backcountry races are what speak to me now. Mm. That's the kind of riding that I really enjoy. And this is absolutely that. So um, yeah, it was definitely high on the bucket list, regardless of the other factors. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I have a feeling you kind of had a general idea of what you were getting yourself into. And, um, and the idea, I mean, this is a real challenge, you know, to throw yourself into, I can see, I can see the type two fun appeal of that. <laughs> yeah. I, I actually would say it was, it was, it stayed almost exclusively type one fun. Um, really it didn't actually, yeah, it didn't really push into only on the final stretch, which we'll get into, but the final stretch, which on paper is fairly, um, mundane ride, easy riding. Um, that was the only time that, um, it sort of pushed into type two fun. The rest of the time I was having, well, and one other moment where I was having a mechanical and I had a bit of a meltdown, but, um, which we, <laughs> we'll also get to, but in terms of the actual riding, 99% of it was, was type one and nice. riding. Well, not just riding, but moving, let's call it moving, moving. Yeah. Moving forward, hopefully on the, on the path. Yeah. What were your, uh, what were your goals going in? What, what did you hope to achieve? I mean, either on the results or just personally having not raced in a while, like what were your, what did you want to accomplish? Um, during this race yeah i think i mean when i when i raced tour divide i'd written down this list and it was like number one finish number two no number one have fun number two finish number three 15 days and i would say this was fairly similar so yeah, I'm I'm flying out today and that's yeah, four, three, four, five days after I finished. And I did that very intentionally because the number one priority or well, number one again, number one priority was have fun. Number two priority was finish at all costs. And um New Zealand can have some pretty it's a very thin sliver of land, so it can have some very unpredictable and volatile weather. Like it can kind of just come out of nowhere. It's not like yeah, I don't know, Europe where you can have like a an extremely accurate weather forecast three weeks out or whatever. It can it can really change the drop of a hat um just based on the geography. And um, you know, so there was potential to up on some really exposed ridge lines to just have to like hunker down in one of the huts for twenty four hours before you can physically move on. Um and then we all know, you know, that there's always risk for serious mechanicals and that sort of stuff. And there's only one bike shop en route. So I knew that, you know, if something went wrong, it could potentially cost me a lot of time to sort of get off route, get a solution, get back on route. Um, and I wanted to finish it no matter what. So I allowed myself a lot of time. And then beyond that, I sort of was hoping to finish in five days, I guess. And, you know, I did have aspirations to win. Of course, I'm extremely competitive. But I didn't really know what to expect from my body after so long. So, yeah, just just to put the best effort I could out there. And yeah. I definitely did that. I, I, I left everything out there. Were you, uh, were you scared going into this or nervous about it? It's been a while since you raced or were you just excited to get back out there and, and push yourself? No, a hundred percent. I was scared. I, um, 
<laughs> uh, I'm not sure if you actually, if you saw my, um, I posted an Instagram post like the day before or the morning of or something, something I'd written. And yeah, a hundred percent I was scared. Um, but at the same time, um, I want to do things that scare me. And Brian, I had a really good conversation with Brian afterwards and, and he was saying like, you know, he create, he, he wanted to create a route where you finishing wasn't a sure thing. And I really liked that. And I, I think if um, some people are familiar with the uh, compressor route on um, Territory, like a mountaineering route where, um, yeah, so it's, it's if, if, if you're familiar with the, the compressor route on Territory in, in Patagonia, um, Maestri literally went up with a, a gas-powered drill and just drilled bolts into the face of the peak to summit it. And the big criticism was that he didn't give the mountain a chance. You know, like if you, you, you're guaranteeing yourself success, you're not, you know, finding, you know, ways to move up the mountain naturally or relying on what the mountain provides you naturally for protection. Um, you're just artificially creating basically a ladder to get you to the top. You're guaranteeing yourself success. And, um, you know, Brian in creating the route wanted to create something where finishing wasn't a sure thing. And that's exactly the kind of challenge that I want to take on is something that scares the shit out of me. Um, that makes me uncomfortable. And that's a hundred percent what this was both, both because the route was incredibly intimidating, but also because, um, yeah, it had been so long and I didn't know, didn't know what I was capable of anymore. I'd love to, I mean, it's kind of a big question. I never know how to ask it exactly, but I'd love to just hear how your race went from your perspective. I'd love to hear about your mechanicals and, uh, the type two fun you experienced at the end and the highs, the lows. I mean, give us an overview of like how your, your race went. Yeah. So the first, the first day, um, I definitely wasn't really feeling myself and that was frustrating. Um, I wasn't able to get a whole lot of food down. I don't know if that was nerves. It was a bit warm, but I'm not sure if I'm not really sure what it was. If it, yeah, it was nerves or heat or something else. Um, but I was sort of struggling to get food down and just, just didn't have the, pe- the power that I sort of expected in the legs. Um, but nonetheless, yeah, I ticked off 355 Ks was a little bit behind where I'd hoped to get the first day and sort of, there's a few key crux points, um, um, that you hit sort of in that, the wall that I was aiming to hit in that second day. Um, the main one being the Dampier range, which is the, one of the big, um, off track, bike carries um and was really wanting to do that before it got dark on the second day um so i knew that really hinged on um a big first day to sort of get you close enough to to get off it before dark on the second day and then again once you did that then it's almost another full day to get to methven to resupply so um to get there before the shop shut to get all those things to line up, you had to pull a really big first day. Mm. Um, so yeah, it was a big first day. It wasn't quite where I wanted to get to, to set myself up for that, but it was, I gave myself a chance. Um, so while it so didn't you exactly stop on how, the first day, like, uh, how much, yeah. How much did you sleep? Because you said I didn't quite to get to where I, I wanted to be. Did you just uh, just fatigued? You were tired. You just had to stop. You couldn't push any further. Like what was kind of dictating why you stopped there? There, there just wasn't any point uh, pushing on. I think it was about three a.m. by the time I pulled up. Um, I slept for ninety minutes or a bit bit longer than ninety minutes. Um, I think I set my alarm for two hours, but I woke up before it. Um, um, and yeah, it was, it was 3 a.m. It gets light. It was it, at the moment it's getting light here at about six. Oh. Um, 
So I knew there wasn't much. I knew I was going to sleep the first day. Um, like I, I, for, for me anyways, there's no point skipping sleep the first day. I think you just do yourself too much of a hole. Um, so I knew I was going to sleep at some point. I, it wasn't worth, if I'm going to sleep at some point, it kind of doesn't really matter when you do that. Right. Um, so, but I figured it, 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 you know, it makes more sense to do it while it's dark than to like push through to get to the place that I wanted to be at and then sleep there while it's daylight. So, right. um, it just made sense at that point to, to go down, sleep for a little bit and, and push on and hope for, um, that my legs would sort of come, come good, um, on the second day. Um, so in the couple more hours got me through to Boyle Lodge, uh, which is a place with the, with the resupply drop. Yeah. So I got, got that pushed through into the, the Hope Kiwi, which is another, um, crux section of, of single track through beach forest. And it's just kind of rideable. Um, it's a long section where you're going like a couple miles an hour. Like it's really slow going where you're just like, you can ride a bit and then you're walking a bit and then you're riding a bit. And then there's some incredible, incredible lines to be had in there. So like really fun technical mountain biking. Um, but it's sandwiched with a lot of on and off walking. Um, yeah, it's just, yeah, rocky, rooty, tight trees down. Um, yeah, techie just, yeah, (laughs) It's not really, it's not mountain biking trail at all. It's, it's yeah. a walking track, but, um, you know, it's a state forest or something as, as I understand, which is, yeah, you're allowed to ride it. Um, mm. and yeah, like I said, there was some amazing riding in there, but incredibly slow going. Um, then later the day in that day, you cross the, um, Haranui river South branch, which is uh, a fairly major river crossing which can be a pinch point if it's rained. Uh, there's no bridge across it. You have to ford it. And even without any like significant recent rain, it was quite high and moving quite fast. Like I, If there'd been any more water in it, it would have been bordering on sketchy. Um, yeah. So it was a relief to get through that. That felt like another crux point sort of ticked off. And then I hit the, the bottom of the Dampier Range at about 7 p.m., with sunset being at about 9. Um, and, um, yeah, that took that took several, or I think through to about midnight to get up and over. So ultimately, we climbed across to, I was with a few other people at that point, um, and we sort of stuck together. Um, finding our way across the ridge and then we sort of hit the the traverse across the face uh, which is not recommended to do at night we hit that at about a bit after nine sort of in the last of the light and at least we're able to sort of get a visual on where we're heading to and sort of pick our bearings uh, before we lost the light entirely and then sort of pushed through in the dark from there um then as actually a really fun descent um there is somewhat of a trail on the other side uh we picked that up and descended down to anderson hut that was the end of the first day um and yeah that day was was i think 120 k's or something um so 50 50 miles or thereabouts like really really slow day is that you mean the second day yeah okay you said first day but you're tired oh, yeah. We'll give you a pass. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that day was incredibly challenging, but cool. And just felt good to have a lot of those, um, a lot of those crux points sort of, um, ticked off. And how are you feeling? Uh, did you start to kind of get more in a groove with, uh, with the race and, or yeah, cause you mentioned you kind of started off a little bit slower and didn't have as much power as you were expecting or hoping for. No, I think at that point, like I was still just, still just kind of surviving, um, moving forwards. Um, I don't think I realized it at the time, but I think moving in, um, with other people, I was like a kind of around people on and off all day. 
Um, and then the next day, the third day, I was just alone pretty much all day. And I, I, I felt like I really started hitting my stride hmm. then. Um, and so I don't like, I think mentally just kind of being alone and just getting to sort of focus a bit more sort of helped me settle into a groove. Um, and that next day is probably, um, yeah, it's probably the hardest. So day two had been hard, but day three, I think is some of the hardest terrain, um, on the route. So there's a long drag, um, out of Mount White station, um, then a bit of road, then you hit Craigie burn and there's uh, a long section. It's like maybe 20 miles of, um, single track, um, which is some sort of, it's, it's all, it's all sort of ridden, um, sort of bit of a mountain bike, um, destination, I guess now, but, um, some of it is old walking track and then some of it is purpose built, um, bike trail. Um, but yeah, about, yeah, 20 miles of that, which is pretty slow going, a lot of climbing and stuff in there, but incredibly fun. And, and the scenery is just amazing. Sort of just below a, like a ski field, I think. So there's some really nice peaks, um, above you while you're in there. And then, oh, wait, so no, sorry, my bad. Day three is not the hard day. Day four is the hard day. I'm getting <laughs> mixed up. Um, and then from there, yeah, then there's sort of like a, a, a long, um, road drag through to methven and then i pushed i got i just made it to um the the grocery store there closed at um eight i think and yeah i think i made it with a bit of time to to spare and then pushed a bit beyond then there's you're sort of in the canterbury plains um so some fast flat roads through there out to Peel Forest. And then from there, you're kind of in the meat of it. So that was a a fairly big day. And I think I got a bit more food in me in Methven. Finally, I got a few burgers and stuff. Um, I'd almost actually already run out of chain lube by that point. So luckily I caught the the bike shop there Mm -hmm. and was able to, to, there's just so many Creek crossings and river crossings that the lubes just constantly getting washed off your chain. So I was Mm -hmm. going through like way more of it than I'd expected. Um, and I was definitely getting close to missing the bike shop. Um, but yeah, just made it in time to catch them and, and get some lube because that, that was definitely stressing me out a bit that I, I wouldn't have that, um, the rest of the way. Um, and then yeah, I got through to Peel Forest. I think I pulled up fairly early there, but there are, yeah, there's quite a few private property sections on, on the route and you're not allowed to camp uh, or sleep within the private property. You're just only allowed to, it's negotiated that we're allowed to pass through, but that, yeah, no camping um, on those sites. So I pulled up fairly early knowing that there was like a, a decently long section going through a station called a high country station called Mesopotamia um, that had a fair bit of climbing. So I knew that was going to take quite some time. So I bivied, uh, at a spot called Peel Forest, a little bit before Mesopotamia, um, being the, and that at the end of the third day, and I think at that point in the race, I was, I was maybe in fourth there, but I'd sort of been bouncing around. Um, I'd say probably fourth through six or seventh um, for those first couple of days. Um, Then, yeah, early, I got up at like 2 a.m. on on the, the fourth day. Um, and that was a real, I had a real struggle through till sunrise. I just like could, could not wake up. Um, but yeah, pushed through and I was at basically the gate, front gate of Mesopotamia, um, just as the sun was coming up and headed up into the station and there's some it's an incredibly beautiful country through there you know just getting the finally we're starting to wake up with the with the sun and there's some you know just like golden rays hitting the, the peaks around me and um, oh yeah yeah just just that magic you know um 
Um, then yeah, you climb up out of the top of the station and then you start ascending, um, Bullock Bow Saddle, which is the first of two, two major climbs. Bullock Bow was pretty manageable. It was sort of, you could ride a bit and then you'd push a bit and then you'd carry a bit and then you could push a bit to get it off your shoulders and push a bit more. And then you could ride a little bit and just kind of alternating between the different modalities of moving. And I actually found that really enjoyable. Um, Hmm. kind of just cycling through them and having a bit of everything and it's like it's like a true like alpine um saddle pass um call whatever you want to call it in in different terminology um and just like yeah this big there's this this big peak above it i'm not actually sure of the name but just like it's it's just like this kind of like slate like trust field just it's all it's all just made up of rock and um yeah just epic views and the descent down the back side of it was incredible um you drop down to a spot called royal hut which was like an old um yeah shelter for when they were um driving stock across across the saddles back in the day and then from there you just and that that's like an 850 meter climb uh which is i don't know three thousand feet or something let's see how good you are 850 did you say 850 meters yeah so about 2800 feet yeah so pretty close was it 3000 yeah you're right there bad yeah so just like a big you know that's a couple hours and then just like this ripping descent down the other side i think i said that but just like incredible um and i'd I'd taken so i i touch on my bike here i took um there's all sorts of different setups mostly exclusive almost exclusively mount like uh well all all mountain bikes i think i saw one person rode with a rigid fork but Hmm. um um yeah everyone was on mountain bikes um quite a few dual dual suspensions um i i was on a i was on my specialized epic evo which is like 120 mil fork 110 mil rear travel four pot brakes um big 180 mil rotors um, some fairly beefy tires like specialized ground control front uh fast track rear which is just like xc tire but both in a grid casing which is sort of extra extra protection on the casing and the sidewalls um just because it is so rocky and i'd heard heard of a lot of people um having yeah tearing sidewalls and that sort of thing on the route so i I thought it was worth yeah taking a bit of a weight penalty for the extra protection there and then also a dropper post and um some people were running aero bars some people weren't i wasn't um i don't think that i would in the future either if i was to come back um, but yeah, definitely geared my bike towards being able to enjoy the descents, um, and really just like let it rip. And, um, I'm really glad I did. And, and I was really happy with my choice of gear and bike. But yeah, so really, you, went, to just, like, you went really minimal. It looked like, uh, if yeah. dot, dot watchers, uh, you know, posted all the rigs or a lot of the rigs and I checked yours out on there and, I mean, I know you were carrying a backpack, uh, food and hydration and stuff in there, but it looked like you were super minimal, which is why I was wondering about the, the resupply points, because it didn't look like you were carrying much at all, man. You went light. Yeah. Yeah. Super, super minimal, which I really enjoy, especially on a technical course. Um, just allows you to move, you know, if you're, if you're going to have to carry your bike or move like ride descend on technical terrain like just having a bike that handles more how you would expect just like a bike not just like this like big boat um well plus you had to carry it yeah um but i i I think it's somewhat of a like a a, in some ways it's a safety element as well because you can just maneuver your bike like it normally does you're not hindered by that all the extra weight um especially yeah as i said in technical terrain but um, yeah, it was just so much fun. Like that, and and that descent was one of the highlights. Um, and yeah, I was just really happy with my choice of bike that I could just just really send it and plow through stuff and 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 enjoy 
enjoy it. And I think ultimately, like, while this course was really challenging, um, it wasn't gratuitous. Like, you would spend hours and hours, like, carrying your bike up to a summit or a high point. But then the descent on the other side is so amazing that, like, there is no, there is never, there was never a, a, any questions of like, why the fuck am I doing this? Like, this is right. awful. It was just like, just anticipation and excitement for what's on the other side. Right. So like, it was always, it was always worth it. And you always knew like very quickly, I could see with Brian's route design that like, he wasn't having you hike up somewhere for no reason. Right. Like you were There's like, a payoff. yeah, yeah. So yeah, so descending as I said to to Royal Hut, and then you start the climb up um, Stag Saddle across the Two Thumb Range, which is probably the the most notorious um, climb on on the route. Maybe on par with Dampier, um, but definitely has a reputation. And again, this is a, a full blown bike carry for several hours, gaining about the same elevation as Bullock Po, so another three thousand or so feet. Um, yeah, carrying your bike the whole way. And there is again, no, um, no trail there is it's, it is part of the Te Araroa walking track that I, I, I mentioned. Um, and so there's a, a pole line of like space, space poles with, uh, reflectors and orange paint on them. And you sort of just follow this basically follow a, a Creek up this gully to the saddle. Um, so you're, you're just navigating your way but like loosely based on the poles and the creek up to the the saddle for several hours carrying your bike um and yeah you you get to the top and there's a, a feek burzen burzenberg or something a, sort of above you uh when you when you hit the saddle and you traverse then traverse out through a yeah, scree field across to pick up a trail on the ridge um below the peak and then there's just like this incredible, like, just like knife point ridge line that you called Snake Ridge that you descend. And again, it's just like this amazing payoff, like just so much fun. Again, just and having the bike to to just really open up and enjoy that was, you know, made it all worth it. Then you, you sort of descend down into Camp Creek and it's a bit of a mission getting out of there you're so close to Tekapo, but there's like another big bike carry up this like steep climb out of the the valley at that point it was sort of early evening coming out of there and then you start descending down some single track into um into Tekapo, and i was pretty worked like my shoulders were pretty wrecked from from all the carrying um and that was making it really really rough just like hitting any like rocks and bumps and that sort of stuff. I was just struggling to sort of hold on to the, the bars a bit. Um, and so How were you going, carrying your bike? Did you have any kind of harness or anything or just no, throw it over pe- your shoulder? Yeah. So some people, um, some people did a harness system. I opted not to, and I don't think I would again. Um, I think I would change a few things with my setup to make, maybe make it a bit more comfortable. But um, ultimately, I think I would go the same just because there is a, there's only a couple of times really where you're carrying it exclusively for several hours. And then a lot of the time, yeah, you're sort of, you, you'll have it on for a bit, but then there'll be a rideable bit. And then it might be easier to just push it along the trail for a bit. Um, so again, like I was sort of saying before, like alternating between those modalities. And I think if you have a harness system, while it may make the carrying easier, it makes it, it does take up more time to sort of put it on or take it off, um, especially if you're co- co- kind of constantly switching between the modalities. So I, I just, yeah, I just had it, um, I don't know, I guess what's known as enduro carrying with the down tube across my shoulders. Mm-hmm. And um, I, I had a, like a, a really good system dialed for that where I could sort of pick it up like on the, like, I could, yeah, without really sort of breaking stride you know, jump off the bike, get it up on my shoulders, start hiking. And then same on the reverse where I could sort of flip it around, put it back on the ground without really breaking stride and, and jump back on. So it was pretty fast and efficient. Um, but and painful yeah, been, in the long run. Yeah. Yeah. Um, 
And so, yeah, I was a bit beat up coming down into Tekapo and I'd been in fourth. Uh, oh, actually, that's not true. I passed um, Miles going up. Um, so I'd been in, I guess, fifth. Then I passed Miles going up um, Bullock Bow Saddle, the first of those big climbs. Um, and he looked like really broken. Um, and and so I'd put some big distance into him. Um, was moving in fourth for, for most of the day. And then coming down into Tekapo, I was just shattered. And we hit, uh, there's a, a pretty corrugated gravel road um, down the bottom that comes around Lake Tekapo into the town. I was going along there and um, Andy caught me. And that kind of broke my um, uh, confidence a little bit because um, I thought I was kind of having a good day, but then was a bit buckled. And then having someone catch me was uh, a bit deflating, I guess. Yeah, so that's then quick, pretty quick resupply in Tekapo and pushed on uh, down the canal. And um, it was pretty special through there, actually. You come sort of through the Mackenzie Basin and you can sort of look back over your shoulder and see um, Aoraki Mount Cook, which is the highest peak in, in New Zealand, um, all snow-capped along with the rest of the, the Southern Alps. It was It was pretty rad. And then you turn off onto this double track and there was a pinchy little climb. And just as I start up this climb, I sort of feel this like thunk and um, something weird sort of moving underneath me. And I jump off my bike and my my dropper is like just like flexing an incredible amount back and forth. Okay. Um, and I kind of just like sit on the ground and and just trying to assess like what the hell to do. Um, and I think at that point I'd been awake for like 22 hours or something. And like I said, was pretty beat up. Like my neck and shoulders were sore and yeah, I just, just didn't really know what to do. Cause uh, there's no more bike shops on route. Tekapo has some bike rental places. So I was like, okay, well maybe I can, I can try and go back there, wait till the morning and see if like, they'll sell me like a post out of one of their bikes if it's the right size and that'll get me rolling again. But without like, I guess like a clear solution, uh, the indecisive or like I, I wasn't really able in my, in my sort of strung out state to make a good decision or make a decision on, on what was the best way to proceed. And kind of somehow that spiraled into me thinking that the best solution was to quit. <laughs> um, and um i knew it was supposed to rain that night and i just on along the canal there's like a it's part of what's called the alps to ocean trail like a, just like a, it's a bike yeah trail um the people tour in new zealand um and so like along there there was a a couple of like pit toilets um i knew it was supposed to rain i i really couldn't make a decision but felt like i couldn't move forwards um, I didn't want to sort of continue on at that point uh, with with my dropper in in the state that it was. Um, just yeah, out of fear that if it catastrophically failed in the middle of nowhere, um, that would leave me in a bad situation. Yeah. Um, so I, I sort of rode backwards a couple of miles to the pit toilet and just like locked myself in there. Messaged a, a couple of friends. Uh, my friend Todd, who's a, a really good mechanic and sort of just asked his, his advice on it and then decided just to, I was going to go to sleep, not set an alarm and sort of just figure it out in the morning when I was sort of more in a better headspace and more capable after some rest to, to make a decision. So I ended up sleeping for like seven hours and obviously yeah. lost some time um, riding backwards on the course as well. And yeah, I woke up in the morning at like seven, eight o'clock and felt really good. Todd had sort of reassured me that he thought it would hold up. And if it did fail, it wasn't going to be catastrophically and offered me some sort of solutions that like I have fairly short legs. So he said that I'd be able to drop the post, like f fully drop the dropper, but then pull because right. I have short legs. There's a large amount of like the rigid part of the post inside the frame. So I could actually pull that up and then give myself extension to essentially have a rigid post yeah. um, as a backup solution. So yeah, opted 
yeah, with his reassurance and, and yeah, after speaking to my mom and my partner and stuff the night before as well for just like some comfort and stuff. Um, I was pretty distraught. Obviously like I spent, um, like a lot of money and to get here and, um, a lot of time tra- and energy training and that sort of stuff. And was just really shattered, especially after like dropping out of Colorado trail. That's my right. last like real big race. Like I just didn't want another DNF. Um, and with that as a prospect was like, yeah, pretty, pretty upset. So yeah, after some, some support from them and some reassuring words from Todd, I was like, woke up feeling really good. And I was like, right, like, let's go. Um, so yeah, as I said, Andy had caught me going into Tecapo. So that put me into fifth. Um, uh, but then when I woke up that morning, I was in like 12th or 13th. I'd got passed by quite Whoa. a lot of people. Like, Holy I, slept shit. For, I slept for so long. I spent a few hours on the phone um yeah i yeah rode backwards on the course a couple of miles so yeah that all added up to like i'm guessing like i lost i mean i probably would have slept three hours that night in an ideal circumstance but i slept seven so if you say i lost four there a couple more messing around and a couple more riding out and back on the course um i'm guessing i I knew you were losing some ground but yeah you lost lost quite a bit of ground like eight eight hours maybe <laughs> um yeah i was so curious how you came back to get to third that's insane how much yeah how much like where is this at uh, out on the course like how many miles or kilometers did you have left at this point to make up that much ground so i had uh 500 k's left so what's that 300 miles okay um, you had some time yeah, was in about 12th or 13th. I woke up and was just like, I don't know. I was like, all right, like I got to get back to like fifth place, back to where I was. If I can pass all these people, at least race like back to there, I'll sort of save my pride a little bit and I'll be happy. That was kind of like where where my mindset was. And finally that day, like, my and I'd eaten a lot in Tecapo and I'd bought a burger that I was going to eat that morning, but because I was feeling sorry for myself. Well, I, I had a burger in Tecapo, but I bought a second one to take with me. And then when I was feeling sorry for myself the night before, I ended up eating that. And I think that, like, just finally, like, an influx of calories, like, real, like, dirty, big amount of calories, just like, finally, and seven hours some, of some, sleep. Yeah. Um, and gave also, me some like, yeah, it's, you know, like mentally, I wonder if there is this like relief. It's like, you know, now you're just like, like kind of like the pressure's off a little bit, or maybe, maybe not. Maybe the, you felt more pressure because you wanted to make, make up that ground. But yeah, I think in some ways it did because I sort of felt like I was out of the race or at least out of, yeah, racing for a podium spot or whatever. And I could just kind of like, just let it all hang loose and whatever. It didn't really matter what happened, you know? Um, um, right. But yeah, I think, yeah, exactly. I, I think in, I think in large, but like obviously the sleep helped, but I had, I had power that day that I didn't have on the, it was like, it was like a normal day. It was like a normal day at home after like sleeping in bed, well rested, like whatever. Like I was on a tear and, um, just woke up just on a mission and I like within a couple of hours caught two riders and just sort of like chilled out for a minute, chatted with them a bit, caught up. Like I hadn't seen them during the race. So it was like, it was kind of cool Ch- chat a bit. And then I was like, all right, I got to go. And just was like, boop. like it was, I was just like on a different level that day. Like, and I, I wish I'd had that from the start because well, I'm, 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 I'm really happy with how I finished the race. Um, on the whole, I wasn't quite as competitive. I wasn't ever sort of challenging Joe or Rufus or putting any pressure on them. Um, and so I, and, and I wish I'd been a bit more com- competitive in that sense. Ultimately, I'm really proud with how the race went and how I handled myself after nearly getting derailed. Um, yeah, like yeah, just, it'd be nice to have like a clean run. It's all you know. That's always, it's like a what if, right? Like, oh man, what if I was feeling good the whole time and had yeah the legs the whole time? It's just you know, it's yeah. a question mark. Yeah, but um, it's cool. Like you know, honestly, like going through that, like I learned a lot. Um, 
you know, any obviously anytime you push up against adversity like that and you come out the other side, like you come out better for it. Um, so yeah, really proud of that. But yeah, it would have just would have been nice if I'd had those legs from the start. And so yeah, all day I was picking riders off. And then I think some somewhere in the middle of the day, I was like, I think I, I think I can ride to the end. Like I just had seven, seven, um, seven hours sleep. Seven hours, I think I've got yeah. enough to push through to the end. I knew we were sort of out of the the gnarliest terrain. Uh there wasn't any meaningful like um or major like hikes or carries left. So it was mostly riding and be moving a fair bit faster. And um yeah, sort of slowly slowly picking riders off throughout that day. Um and then just before the evening, uh I ran into a a dot watcher. I hadn't had service for a while. And um found out that uh uh Steve who'd been in third had had a crash and actually mm-hmm. broken his freaking femur um I know, man. which is awful just awful and 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 he was on a tear like I'd been sort of been killing myself to sort of stay within an hour or two of him and was really struggling to keep up um like before the drop and post incident um and so yeah it just felt really terrible for him um but at the same time, it like meant that I went from fifth to fourth, um, and yeah, there was a opportunity to to sneak onto the podium. Um, and if I didn't have a fire lit under my ass at that point, like I certainly did then, um, that was near sunset on the fifth day um and yeah so just went on a tear i raced down into uh Ochrahua, managed to get uh a resupply there just um and sort of tore off into the night i knew andy was like a little way in front of me and i had a good stretch there with reception i was sort of keeping an eye on his movements I, there was a hut up on um near Mount Teviot. I saw he, he stopped there. He, he was, I closed the gap with him back to about two hours over the course of the day, which I was like pretty impressed with. Like, um, I was, I was really, really happy that I got it that close. And, uh, I knew he'd been sleeping about four hours a night was sort of hoping he'd do the same. That'd give me a chance to not only catch him, but, uh, get a few hours past him. Yeah. I managed to get past the point where he was the hut he was stopped in and sort of turned off my lights and pedaled <laughs> so to so sort of stop the freewheeling noise. I just didn't want any any indication <laughs> that, that that I was there. And funnily enough, talking to him after he said um that he actually slept through he he planned to only sleep two hours, which would have had him waking up about the time I came past. But he he, he ended up sleeping another two hours um and getting his his usual four and then um yeah that gave me the opportunity to 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 get a bit of a lead yeah i got through to about 4 a.m and was like just yeah could could hardly see anymore like just like could not focus on the trail or what was going on and was just really pushing hard to to move on but was really struggling with it so i sort of sat down for five minutes and just closed my eyes on the trail just to try and get something back so I could keep moving forwards a bit more safely. And uh, when, when I got up, I, I had a look at the... I saw I had some reception. I had a look at the tracker and saw that Andy was moving and uh, Kurt Standin um, was about the same point, which was nine nine Ks back, five, I guess like five five miles or so back, which was in that terrain. It was about an hour. And from there, there was only one last big climb up um the lamellor tops and then once you descend off lamellors to to lawrence there's only about 100 miles to go of sort of rolling farmland and uh i knew kurt especially was uh he's, he's really fast on the flats like he's a bit more comes from a bit more of a roadie background and he's a he's a bigger bigger lad so really turns out a lot of power on the flats and is a lot faster, whereas my strength is more, yeah, like steep technical climbing. So 
I knew that I had to put some time into them going over the llama laws and yeah. So just, yeah, got up and, and really dropped the hammer and was like sprinting up every little climb or roller or whatever, just knowing that that was, that was just opportunity and time that I would have. And I knew, I knew, I, I really knew that that, that effort over the top would cost me and that probably the last hundred miles would be a bit of a death march, but I, I, I thought it gave me the best chance of success. I thought if they got down to, to Lawrence and saw that they were close, that they'd probably um, push through a lot quicker and, and, and yeah, just be on me, sort of just believe, have more belief that they could catch me. And obviously that would sort of buoy them um, right along. Um, and I wanted as to shut happens, down their hopes and dreams. <laughs> yeah. Um, as it happened, there was, we knew that there was a, a big weather front coming in and it hit just as I started descending uh, off, off, I'd come over the top and it descended a few hundred meters of elevation and then the, the front hit. Um, so I think that worked to my advantage in some ways because they were still having to climb and it was pretty boggy, muddy sort of terrain up there. Um, and by the time it started raining, I was about to turn onto, uh, into a forestry block which was sort of more gravel based, uh, trail. So it wasn't as, as slick and I could still sort of descend fairly full bore. Whereas they, they were still descent or still, still had some climbing to go and some descending on some kind of sketchy, slippery clay kind of based trail. So it, yeah, it sort of definitely added some, some time in there for me. And then because I had put in that effort, it had opened the gap up and I think they got down into Lawrence pretty like wet and cold and seeing somewhat of a sizable gap. Um, I think took some extra time to just like warm up, get some food. Whereas I think, yeah, if it had been closer, they might've been encouraged to, to really just make a minimal stop and press on. So I think I, I ended up buying myself a bit more time by sort of putting that, that move in. And, um, by the time they left Lawrence, I think, I had about a two and a half hour lead. I'd been keeping an eye on it after I left. So I took, so I took note of the time I left um, and then was keeping an eye on until I saw they left just so I had sort of some idea of what I had to, to play with. And the, the weather didn't really let up. Like it was obviously less exposed being out of the mountains, but just getting smashed by like headwinds and, and driving rain sort of like the whole way down. And this was really like the one point where it became like not fun. I was so tired at that point and just wanted to sleep, but you know, I couldn't without like losing my, my position and I couldn't just because there was nowhere to really take, take shelter or, or anything out of the weather, um, just big open farmland and, uh, just had to, yeah, keep pushing on and yeah, it was a real struggle and I, I, I was really struggling to keep my eyes open, um, through the day. And Kurt managed to, I think with about 50, 50 Ks to go, um, 30 miles, I had got it down to about eight Ks, uh, of a gap or oh, five, wow. five miles. Um, yeah, really close. He'd, he'd taken a lot of time. I, I'd been moving slowly and he'd taken a lot of time out of me. Like that was enough that it, um, when I saw that it really, yeah, lit a fire under me again. And I sort of found yeah. this, this final wind and this had taken most of the day sort of to get through there because of the wind and the rain It had really slowed us down. So I think that was about maybe like five o'clock in the evening, which was a lot longer than, you know, when I sort of set off that I was like, I can do this last 500 Ks in a, a single push. I was sort of expecting I'd be finishing closer to lunchtime. So it'd be just, you know, maybe... 30 hours or so but at this point it was pushing in to you know 33 34 hours awake and um yeah it was really really wearing on me at that point being so late in like a second day of being awake but yeah that really lit a fire under me i knew at that point i wasn't i just wasn't going to give it give it up no matter what like i'd, I'd work so hard to claw my way back to that third place right. and um so yeah, yeah i just put the power down i knew I knew I didn't have to like, I knew if I could put the power down for a couple of hours and sort of just hold that gap, then 
you know, once I got it down to say like the last 10 Ks, if there was still a 10 K gap, then, you know, he's not going to go double my speed. He might be moving faster, but at, at a certain point, like I'd sort of be safe. So I knew I just had to, if I could just put in a really good effort for a couple hours, um, then, then that'd be enough. And so, yeah, I, I sort of found, found the energy to, um, yeah, put in a really solid effort for a couple of hours and really just hard on the pedals. And yeah, exactly that. I, I sort of checked, yeah, with about 10 Ks to go and, and he, um, yeah, but sort of still held the same sort of gap at that point. So I was able to sort of just like sit up and the, the sun started to actually come out at that point, which was really nice. Um, at that point it was about eight o'clock and as i said sort of sunset was around nine so you're sort of just getting into that golden hour kind of time and and just coming into the finish with the opportunity to just sit up and relax a little bit and take it all in there's sort of one final prick of a climb i mean it's in the scheme of things it's nothing but it's a, a steep bit of sealed road and the legs were burning going up it but it was actually really nice because it means you descend down to the finish um, yeah. <laughs> out to, out to slope point and yeah, just with the, the, the golden hour light and stuff, it was really magical and, and emotional and, um, yeah, definitely did a, a bit of crying and yeah, like I, like I sort of on the bike on while the, you're finishing or, or when you finished, uh, both or both. both. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I, I got no shame in, I got no shame in that. Um, Oh heck no, man. You earned it. Um, you earned a good cry. Yeah. Um, and like I said, just like, before super super proud of that final effort um and like that felt like that was what i knew that i was sort of capable of or or hoped that i was capable of like had had been capable of in the past and was hoping to find again i guess um so yeah really really proud of that final effort um yeah especially it ended up being a, a 500k 36 hour push to to finish on yeah like a five minute sit down um to close my eyes and yeah salvage uh, a pretty pretty good result considering that i felt like my first three three days of racing weren't weren't really the best yeah you know that that was exactly my thought and kind of take away and and was going to be my question because like on one level a little bit of a bummer that you weren't fully uh, as you know fast and as strong as you hoped to be but like do not being as fast and as strong as you as you were hoping and then you know having the mechanical it kind of it put you in a position where you got to kind of learn about yourself and and reprove to yourself you know that you're a really strong rider i mean you picked off eight places and then you held on to third place over that last effort so ultimately it sounds like you yeah you like relearned like proved to yourself that you can you still got it you know what i'm saying is that kind of like your overall takeaway yeah for sure and um i think i still my fitness probably isn't where it needs to be to be like hyper competitive um like i don't think it it, it, it's what it was and i think part of that is obviously not being a courier anymore i don't have that like you know four or five hours of of just base miles every single day day in day out um but i i've I've have been like less focused on on the bike on the intervening years so like while i did have a really good like four month block leading into this i think before that, like I, I was, I was uh, riding, um, like every week, but not necessarily like, you know, like four or five days a week or whatever. So I don't think I had that consistency that my fitness in four months really got is at its yeah. fullest potential. Um, so I think moving forwards, yeah, continuing with, with this consistency, I think I still have room to improve with, uh, my fitness and my power and, um, hopefully yeah, combining that with everything that I sort of learned and relearned through this experience, I can sort of get back to uh, a more competitive um, place and uh, sort of, yeah, realize uh, what I believe my potential is. 
So, yeah, that's, that's what I'm curious about this experience. Um, what do you think is next? I mean, did this reignite some of that old fire for going fast and being in contention on some of these big races? Do you have any, any other ones planned? Like, where are you at with all that? Yeah. Um, the plan is to head back to Colorado in August for, um, the Colorado trail. Oh, Um, hell yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's, that's one that I feel like I've got unfinished business with. Um, but also the time that I did spend on the trail was just some of the best riding I've ever done. So yeah, in, in, in more ways than one, it's something that I feel like I've, I've got to, I've got to get done. Um, yeah, I, I need to see the rest of that trail, like on a personal level, but yeah, like I feel like I have unfinished business in terms of, yeah, something, something to prove there. So yeah, really excited to, to get back to Colorado and yeah, also feel that this experience, uh, both within the race, uh, but the route itself, I think lends itself really well to preparing for, uh, for Colorado. So I'm, I'm really excited. Yeah to, to build off of this experience, but I think it's been a really good one in terms of setting me up for success there. Yeah. Yeah. A good, good experience, both physically and mentally to kind of re-engage with this. And then I, I think there's a lot of positive takeaways that you can take away from this and keep your training up between now and Colorado trail and get back at, get, get back some of that. I mean, altitude sickness, man, that's a tough one. Um, Will you just do some more like altitude training going into that one, you think? Yeah. So I, I've obviously got to figure things out with work and uh, my partner and and just organize things in life. But the hope is that I can get over there uh, maybe a month or so beforehand. Oh, wow. Um, at least I think last time I only had about a week beforehand. So at least to have a few weeks before. Yeah. Just as much time as possible beforehand. I've got to figure out exactly what that'll look like, but you know, I think an ideal world would be a month. Um, but yeah, a lot to figure out to make that happen. But yeah, the more time over there, the better and definitely more than last time. Yeah. And hopefully that'll yeah. give me the, the best chance of success. I love it, man. Well, I, I know you got to get on a plane. I feel bad. This is uh we've kind of, I've taken up more of your time than we, we had talked about. Um, yeah. Congratulations on coming in third, you know, uh, back on the podium, your first race in, in four years and a really strong finish to the race. So overall, man, I, you know, it was, it was fun to see you back in the field and fun to watch your dot. Uh, th- you got a lot of fans in the bike packing space. So I'm sure a lot of people will be happy to see you having a good result and, and hopefully happy to listen to this podcast and, and hear about how it went. And, uh, wish you well on, uh, on your future at Colorado trail. It'll be cool to see you back in the field and hopefully you can get that monkey off your back. Cool. Cheers, man. Appreciate it. And yeah, thanks for, thanks for having me for a chat. It was uh, yeah, really fun. Yeah, absolutely. We'll do it again one day and tell uh, all my bikepacking friends there in the house. I said, Hey, yeah, we'll do. <laughs> all right, Lewis. We'll have, a, uh, have safe travels, man. We'll talk to you again. Cheers, man. Bye. All right. Later. All right, everybody. Thank you so much for tuning in to today's episode. I hope you enjoyed catching up with Lewis Adore as much as I did. If you enjoyed today's episode, please consider supporting this show. You can do so in several ways. You can sign up as a sustaining member of the Bikes or Death podcast over at patreon.com forward slash bikes or death. We also accept one-time donations through PayPal. You can find a link for that at bikesordeath.com. You can also find a link for all of our affiliate links at bikesordeath.com. And we have a web store with some items in there. So we try to make it easy for you to find a way to support the show. So those are just some of the ways. Of course, more than anything, I just want to thank you so much for being here. It is always a pleasure. And until next week, you know what to do. Go ride your damn bike. It was the middle of the night You grabbed your knife and you held it tight The sounds of beasts kept you awake The sounds they made kept you afraid In the morning you packed your bike Memories forgotten from the previous night You rode faster than ever before Was it your imagination or merely fear?
folklore. Fear turned into strength as you pushed further. Every pedal stroke, stronger and firmer. Your bike feels weightless, your legs aren't tired. You think to yourself, just a few more miles. Bikes.